And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss emerging trends in data architecture. What's the next big thing? Sponsored today by Datastax. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinars. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar or follow Donna further, you may do so at community.datadiversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Jen from Datastack for a word from our sponsor. Jen, hello and welcome. Hi, thank you, and hi everyone. I'm Jen Yonemitsu. I'm a Director of Product Marketing at Datastax. I'm going to go through a very quick presentation that um, goes through how to simplify uh, the complexity of data and advanced workloads in today's applications. Um, and we think generally that in today's world, your applications need a data management platform that is capable of processing mixed workloads, um, doing that efficiently, and so you can focus more easily on getting value and higher, a higher level of intelligence from your data. Um, so we will focus in on um, NoSQL-like platforms, um, in this case, Apache Cassandra. We think this is a critical modern data based foundation that will um, service mixed workloads very well. Um, for those of you that don't know Apache Cassandra, it is an open source developed project. It is a distributed data management system and is truly the best in class for zero downtime. And the reason why um, they can claim this or the project can claim this is really due to its masterless architecture. A quick explanation of masterless is that all nodes are peers, so if any node um, goes down or fails, another node can automatically subsume, subsume its workload. Uh, this masterless architecture provides true fault tolerance for data, and it can do this at massive scale and distribution. Macy's, for example, is one that we like to tout a lot. It has over seven years of zero downtime, and this includes um, through upgrades and maintenance. Um, so that's uh, pretty impressive, but with that, uh, there is also more um, we can talk about when it comes to enterprise grade strength of Cassandra. It was designed for linear scale, and that means that with the addition of new nodes, there is a predictable amount of performance that you'll see as an increase. And in other words, there is no um, performance degradation with the addition of new nodes or a scaling out. Um, the project is over 10 years old, and it has been contributed to by the community, including hundreds of big brands. You'll see some of those in the bottom corner there on the left. Um, and it's really been battle tested by hundreds and thousands of um, enterprise um, massive scale deployments, companies like Netflix and FedEx, Apple, China Mobile, and so on. In today's world, we think um, you need to manage your data on an underlying infrastructure that is also purpose-built for data portability. Um, so that includes being able to scale um, and not only be deployed, but scale across on-prem, hybrid, multi-cloud, and even inter-cloud deployments for those that are looking at multiple cloud providers. Um, Cassandra does this in a unique way and it empowers you to build and run modern applications that scale across. I like to say scale across because you can really go across different environments, um, across data centers, on-prem, and clouds, and so on. So who is data? Datastacks? Our roots are in open source and uh, NoSQL, beginning with the Apache Cassandra project. We are the NoSQL leader in resilience, resilient high-performance data management solutions. Um, we have built a high performance um, data platform that's powered by Apache Cassandra, and that is uh, Datastax Enterprise. With our expertise in data management, we also provide a lot for the communities and for developers, and I'll share some links at the end. Um, we host uh, you know, conferences and events, meetups, 
um, one of our biggest uh, content assets on our website is actually the digital docs um, for Cassandra. And um, there are, we run an academy for online courses and, and boot camps and so on. So moving on, um, these are some of the things we see all the time from our customers that contribute to data diversity and complexity. So um, I'm guessing many of these are not new to this crowd. Things like legacy data that you need to integrate real time or streaming requirements, uh, disparate data or siloed data, um, data security, unpredictable scale, massive scale um, with the apps today and then scaling across the clouds. Um, with this modern data and the shapes um, and types and diversity, we really see that um, the workloads of today really require more than just your traditional or single workload um, capable data platform. And what I think is um, important to note here is the data management evolution. So beginning with relational on the left, moving to NoSQL, and then um, even graph becoming more dominant in today's world where people are looking at the shapes of their data and trying to match it with a data platform. So these are some of the challenges that contribute to the mixed or advanced workload requirement that we see. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, um, assuming we'll share the slides here, but things like how to ingest data for different types of um, you know, uh, workloads and data models. Um, so you need data model flexibility, API flexibility. Um, when you're talking about mixed workloads, you need to think about how all of these things will apply to the different types and shapes that you model in. So intelligent indexing, connected data, and uh, so on. So we're going to go through an example here of a mixed workload. Um, and some of the things to keep in mind are how complex is your query? Is it simple or is it somewhere in between? Is it really complex? And how fast do you need it? So I love this slide. We'll go through it um, fairly quickly. But the first being, um, you know, find me Dave. So there are like millions of Daves in the database. Um, and that's bubble number one under CQL. So that's a simple query and lookup. And in Cassandra's case, it's, it's lightning fast. It's designed to be fast in that kind of query. Um, and what you'll see as you go through the different queries is a higher level of complexity in the query um, and also a different response time. So you see with one application zoning in on a customer 360 type application where you want a holistic view of your customer, the relationships and their behavior, um, you'll see that you might have maybe a mix, maybe one to two, maybe even three types of workloads that you would need to ma manage. In our case, in DataStacks Enterprise, our implementation actually fully integrates those different components, search, graph, analytics, and stream processing. So you can get to all of those types of queries with one database. In our case, that's our recommendation to cover mix workloads and really complex data. So I think what uh, this brings is really blended workloads that you can get to with a database that can handle um, different types of data. So again, just to summarize, um, simplifying data complexity requires, we think, a single data platform, one that can handle mixed workloads, one that can handle real-time requirements, and one that can scale across data centers and different platforms. And so here, um, just a reference, a couple of links, um, online courses if you want to learn more about Cassandra um, or Tinkerpop and uh, Data Stacks Enterprise. Thank you, and uh, over to you, Donna. Thanks. Jen, thank you so much for this great presentation and kicking us off. Um, if you have questions for Jen and questions about Data Stacks, you can submit it in the bo bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A section, and she will be joining Donna in the Q&A at the end of the presentation today. So now let me introduce to you the speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management. Oh, with over 20 years of 
of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, I will give controls to Donna here to get the webinar started for her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hi, thanks. It's always a pleasure to do these and kick off a new year with uh, data architecture. So thanks all who have joined. Um, Shannon's already given me an introduction and I think a lot of you know me, but um, I both run a consulting uh, firm that does information management and I've also been in the industry for Seems like God, God, God loads of years um, and active with things like Dame International, which I know a lot of you are involved with as well, um, and have done some product development uh, with some of the vendors on the market. So um, if you're not aware, this is a regular series uh, on data architecture. Uh, this year's lineup uh, hopefully fittingly starts with kind of some of the emerging trends and sort of as we go into the new calendar year, what is the next big thing? What are the things we should be thinking of? Um, you know, Jennifer gave us some great ideas of some of the new technologies that are out there and, and that can sort of be overwhelming as we look and we're trying to do our day jobs, um, which is why Data Diversity is, is a great resource. Give them a little plug. Um, but we, we hope you can join us for some of the others. You'll see that there's kind of a wide ranging uh, lineup each month. Um, next month is on data strategy. We'll cover you know the gamut from cloud warehousing to master data management, et cetera. So you can register for all of these and you know Shannon generally says this as well, but they're all on demand after and you will get the recording if you can't miss it live because I know how things go. <laughs> we all have great intentions of making it live for the great chat, but then the uh, work <laughs> comes up. So uh, thanks for you who were able to pull away and join. So hopefully I can see you on some of these others. Um, what we're going to cover today is something a little special. We gave a bit of a sneak preview last month, also with Data Stacks. Um, on this Data Diversity report that we did, to, I did together with uh, Data Diversity on some trends in data management. Um, and there'll be another one coming up in a few months this year. So the, this information really came from you, the collective you as a community. Um, and these are more and more valuable the more folks chime in. So I will give you some of the findings. You can also download this both from the Data Diversity website as well as the Global Data Strategy website if you want to see the actual report. Uh, and we'll give you some kind of you know, highlights um, and some findings from this because I think, you know, we all do this day to day in our own office. It's nice to kind of step back and see what others are saying and see what kind of uh, the trends in the industry are going in. So because we are in information management and metadata management, we all love definitions, right? So how do we start a whole discussion on data management without some core definitions? Um, I already referenced DEMA, the Data Management uh, Association, they have their body of knowledge and of course they have a definition for data management. Uh, and you'll see there that it's this idea of you know, managing and developing your information assets, controlling and protecting them and also throughout their life cycles, which I think is important. A lot, a lot of us think of sort of data in the moment, uh, but for those of us who are in the industry understand that there's a whole life cycle around you know, creating, maintaining uh, and retention periods and deleting data or offloading data. Um, what I thought also was interesting, and this was what's great, uh, you are not a shy c collective crowd in data management. I know the chat is always very uh, <laughs> active on these sessions, which is great. Also, I try to catch them after the fact. Um, but we get a lot of good uh, just anecdotal evidence, you know, input from these surveys. It isn't always just yes or no. So I thought some of the survey responses were particularly interesting and we sort of called out a few. Uh, this idea of the people, processes, and technology around data as an asset, and I'll cover that a lot more in this presentation, because the more I am a super techie nerd, and that's a great thing, I always say it's a good thing, um, but the more I'm in the business, I realize that it's the people in the process around that technology that really makes its thing. We've all been on that project that you think, and you might be very right, that you've built this great application and you stayed up till midnight to do it, but no one sort of cared, or some other project that wasn't even as technically good sort of got the funding and the buy-in. So why did that happen? Or maybe you built it and it was hot for a few months and then everyone sort of forgot about it and it wasn't maintained. So that's why that people process part is so important to data as, as you manage the life cycle. Um, you know, second one touches on that as well. It's an organizational capability supported by tools, processes, and standards, and people, of course. But I think sometimes we, you know, we techie folks love to start with the tools and the tech, um, but really the tech just support the business. Um, and I thought that last one touches on that as well, that data management really makes the business activities more effective through efficient data management. We'll talk a lot about that in this particular
particular presentation because that is hot. Um, so if you've joined these uh, sessions before, you've probably seen this framework. This is our framework at Global Data Strategy that we use for our practice. Uh, we've gotten some great feedback, so we keep using it. Uh, but it, it's sort of it's similar to the DMBOK a bit, but it's sort of augmented by our focus on the business, particularly with our, our practice, um, and some gray hairs and scars from doing this from many years of kind of what matters. So we always start at that level one, which is that top down, which I mentioned, of what's the business strategy? Um, again, when Jennifer talked about all those different use cases of, you know, are we just finding Dave? Are we trying to get the social media around Dave? Are we trying to, you know, do real-time data streaming of, of what he's listening to on, you know, Netflix? Um, that might not be important if you're a bank, uh, so <laughs> that last one. Uh, so really understanding what the use case is for data is so important um, and how, more importantly, how data can drive business strategy. So it's sort of that, that little alignment piece in the middle really highlights that it's bi-directional. So, and I'll talk more about that as well. Yes, of course, don't do anything in tech unless it's aligned with the business strategy. But more and more, and why I'm still in the business, honestly, um, for those of you who have kind of a business focus or interest in kind of, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship, you know, often it's the data that drives new business ideas. Think of Uber or Netflix. Those are data companies that happen to do other things, right? So that's what's kind of fun and exciting about being in data right now. But there's also that level five that also gets a lot of us really interested in being in the business of, you know, databases. And that's just not those little cylinders you see there kind of look like relational databases. And we'll talk more about that in this presentation. They are still the leader. They're not going to go away anytime soon. Um, but there's other options as well. You know, there's big data platforms. There's streaming. There's documents. We often forget that when we sort of focus on data. Um, that there's documents out there too. I know that came up with one of my clients. We were talking about data security and privacy. I think it was GDPR. And they said, well, we don't have to worry about PDFs and documents. You know, we're the data management group. And I said, well, if, if you steal someone's credit card and they get, their identity theft has been you know, out in the market and you say, oh, it's okay, it was on a PDF. <laughs> I don't think that'll matter. It's still PII, right? It's still their information. Um, and so information comes in a lot of formats. So you need to look holistically across documents, databases everything. Um, and then as we move up the stack, how do you integrate that data? They are in disparate sources, so how do you manage a PDF with a database with a you know, XML stream? Um, and then what most importantly, I think, near and dear my heart is metadata management, which is not only the technical integration, but also uh, the data, uh, the business focus, right? What does the data mean? What's the context around that? And level three is maybe not very elegantly, I just say it's what you do with data, what's <laughs> the stuff around it that adds value. So we'll talk a lot in this presentation because it's hot is, you know, still business intelligence, analytics, how you get insights from data. But we who are in the business know you can't do that without the things on the right, things like data quality, uh, data architecture, uh, modeling, um, and making sure the way that data is stored is correct. Is it a data lake and or is it a data warehouse? Do we have core domains mastered? Uh, do we have that single view of Dave? Um, can we understand that there's a single view of customer, of product, of invoice, of patient, right? And then data governance is that part that we already touched on with just the definition of data management, kind of the people layer. And yes, there's technology for governance and we could probably wax poetic and argue all day as we do in, <laughs> in architecture. We love to have some good debates. You know, is architecture governance? Yes. Is data quality governance? Yes. But I think highlighting it at this level is the people and the process and more importantly, the culture. Does everybody in this data-driven business understand that their role, their accountability and their ownership of data? And then how do you have the policies and processes in place? And more and more, and I'll talk about this as well, the idea of data processes and data governance processes and just plain old business processes are, are sort of merging and melding. And when data governance is done right, it kind of becomes that business as usual activity. You don't necessarily think you're doing data governance, it's just you're doing your job. <laughs> and data happens to be a part of that. So we'll kind of cover a lot of these things when we go through the survey because it sort of touches on a lot of the areas of the industry. Um, one of the key things that popped out of the survey, and I'm going to kind of interject and interweave things I we discovered and heard in the survey with things I see day to day in my practice, and I think a lot of times they overlap. A couple times we've seen some things that weren't in the survey that I'll highlight, but this is one that we're seeing everywhere, and I'm sure you are too. This idea of the data-driven business, or I'll talk more about this too, the data-driven organization. It isn't always a retail business. Um, 
what was heartening is that in the survey, 73% of the folks said that they see data as a strategic asset. I mean, we've been sort of, you know, chiming from the rooftops for years in the industry about that, but I think more and more, I mean, most of my engagements uh, in our practice come from the business, uh, business sponsors, uh, sometimes from IT, but more and more it's business people that are saying, hey, I get this data is a strategic asset. asset. I'm not exactly sure how to get there, um, but I know I need to. When you look at the drivers for that, um, a lot of it is the traditional yet always important things like how can we be more efficient, how can we save costs um, and increase efficiency, which you could say, yeah, the same old, same old, but I, I think that's also heartening in that um, people are seeing that data management, and uh, you could have asked me this 20 years ago and I would have told you, <laughs> um, data management helps increase efficiency. Sometimes and folks uh, may see the price tag of, oh, it's going to cost me this much to put a data quality process in place or a master data management hub in place, but the long-term effect, as we know, um, can be much more uh, beneficial over time or because what folks are doing when you start looking, people are spinning, right? They're doing it in spreadsheets or they're cleaning up or I was talking to a client just this morning of <laughs> the poor finance analyst that was doing the the report. He had been up, literally had been up all night trying to get the numbers to match. Um, and it was his boss who said, can't we do this in a warehouse, something more efficient? Um, because it is. Once you get it right, people can actually do their day jobs and not spend time trying to make the data right. Um, which is sort of a newer trend, and you'll see the numbers aren't quite as high, but I know in our practice, this is actually one of the leading things we do. So we see that number probably more in the 80% of the folks that come to us. Um, might be just the, you know, selective um, who, who tends to come to us, but uh, digital transformation, and I know that's a buzzword, um, but most buzzwords, when I, I sort of counter some of the negativity towards buzzwords, I know, what was it, in the 90s when they said, uh, you know, the the e-commerce, you know, the e-business, right? Everything's dot-com, and isn't the dot-com bubble burst? It's like, yeah, we don't have any any dot-coms anymore. That Amazon dot-com was just a fad, right? It's not that it went away. Some of the unsuccessful ones didn't stay, but it sort of became business as usual. Who even thinks that dot-com is a big deal anymore? Of course it's dot-com. It's brick and mortar that's actually kind of the, the outlier, right? So we're seeing that with digital transformation, it's a big word, um, but half my life is on a cell phone. If I can't sort of do my banking or buy a ticket for a show or do anything on my phone or my, my computer, I almost don't do it. So that is digital transformation, and as we know, that's driven by data. You can't do that exciting stuff uh, without the foundation of a data platform or a data management foundation. Um, so I, I did want to drill into that a little bit because you saw, let me just go back one for a moment. You saw there are almost two ends of the spectrum in a way. How do we just save costs and increase efficiency? That's sort of, you know, business as usual, just do what we do better. And then we're talking digital transformation, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum. And I do think there's a slight difference. I mean, you one could argue, that's old curmudgeons, that you know, we've been doing data-driven business forever. And of course we have. Many, many companies have. When you think of insurance. Um, I think of some of the uh, actuaries out there saying, you know, data science, we've been doing that since, since we had companies. You know, they are, insurance almost is a data-driven company. It's how you manage risk and understand uh, your, your, your book of business through data, right? Um, so the idea that you can be more efficient and reduce the redundancy and eliminate manual effort by data and digital, that we've been doing that for a long time, um, as well as, you know, how do I have better marketing campaigns with click-through rates? How can we understand how we're using our product? I kind of put that into you're optimizing your business. How do we do what we do already better? But what I do think is different, and even that's not so different anymore, um, is this idea of becoming a data company where you're really transforming the business or coming up with a new business model entirely, which is that idea if you're a data person and you're also an entrepreneur, great time to be alive right now. Um, where data is the product or monetizing the product. And this could be several things. Uh, if you've been on these before, you may have heard me talk of, we had a big uh, energy client in the UK that really just decided that, you know, doing, you know, home, home heating oil uh, was sort of a declining business as people are trying to use less energy. So how can they monetize the data they have and, and use, they really have sort of an app-driven, um, data-driven application where people can control their energy costs and see analytics on their own energy usage and data was their new hot product. So there's either companies transforming themselves, realizing that, you know, kind of that exhaust of data that comes out of our business can be monetized and used and used for a different purpose, and or um, maybe there's entirely new business models. Think of the Uber, right? That is a data company that's using data in a very creative way um, to be a new 
business, or you could even argue Amazon, right, is a data company that use data really, really well. Um, and so I think that's what's kind of exciting as we look at different data management opportunities. I, I thought this was interesting to show. This is an uh, article from or a report from the World Economic Forum, um, and what they're saying, they actually had some metrics around this, is that, you know, in the old days, everything was brick and mortar. You actually sold stuff, and, and business was driven by a product focus. So if you look in the old days, a whole seven years ago, <laughs> where the big companies in the market were things that sold things, Walmart, right, uh, you know, Exxon Mobil sold energy. So you look now, and it's rather than a product focus, it's more of a data focus. So Alphabet, Google, right, I mentioned Amazon, Microsoft. You could argue that some of these are digital slash data, but they're so interlinked. Um, and their finding was that for the first time, or in recent history, it's data is more valuable than the actual products that are being sold. Like, you know, Amazon would be a great example of that. I don't think they're the leader because they sell necessarily the best widgets. They sell the best the widgets in the best way through data. So I thought that was an interesting kind of highlight that even the World Economic Forum is saying, hey, data is the way to go. Everyone needs to be in some way data driven. Either your company is data or your company runs on data in a more efficient way. I found this interesting, and this is from our practice, a kind of a fairly accurate infographic uh, bubble chart, because um, I've been in the industry ooh, probably going on 20 to 30 years now, somewhere in the middle there. Um, and, and all of us who have been in, in data management for a long time have probably worked in finance and or insurance and or government uh, or some of the big, you know, player healthcare, some of the big players that have gotten the value of data management for a whole long time. Um, what's fun for me, and why my job is so cool someday, <laughs> I feel, um, is that more and more organizations are understanding data management and the value of it. And to be fair, I think a lot of the tools are just a lot more consumable. Um, the stuff the data stacks in the beginning mentioned, I mean, that was the fact that that's fairly available to the average organization now at a reasonable price, I mean, with light years ahead of what anyone could do even just five years ago, right? So the fact that this is ubiquitous and there's a lot of open source and there's a lot of opportunity gets more people in the market. So we have folks from non small nonprofits. We have a Head Start program doing data. We worked with a small museum in the Midwest. We have many of them here now in Latin America that a car manufacturer. It's probably not new for them, um, but they are looking at new things like Internet of Things. Um, so the diversity of types of information uh, companies, and that's why I, when I kind of talked about the data-driven business, um, some of my nonprofit clients, you'll see that's a big chunk of our business, not necessarily by design, but I will talk more about that, this kind of push towards data toward data for good. Uh, they often remind me it's not a data-driven business, it's a data-driven organization or a data-driven mission or a data-driven culture, which I find kind of an interesting spin. Uh, I put that similarly with the universities and education. We seem to be working with a lot of those as well. Um, and it's, again, a very different model than trying to sell more widgets or maximize profits. You're trying to maximize people and, and mission and value, which is kind of a different spin, which is kind of fun. Um, the other key finding we saw in this, which kind of ties into the data-driven business, is the idea of having better insights around your business, which is, in some ways, you could say the traditional business intelligence and analytics. That's not, like, we have not been doing that before in the past. It's, you know, been around for quite a long time. Um, but it's still valuable. It's kind of like saying dot-coms went away, right? We still have dot-coms. We're just maximizing it. So you'll see here that 80% of respondents, not, not that they were using it. I think if they were using BI, it's probably closer to, uh, probably higher than that, I won't venture a guess, but that it was one of their key drivers for data management. So when we said, what is the main thing you're working on with data management, it was overwhelmingly BI and analytics, and we put both of those together. We didn't separate kind of reporting from kind of advanced analytics, and as you know, they are slightly different. Um, but we did sort of uh, break that out that 87% were doing BI, or your traditional sort of reporting. 87% uh, also had a data warehouse. And when you look um, at uh, kind of that idea of is it big data analytics, is it warehousing, you'll see that about 22% in this case, we're using both a data lake and a warehouse, and I kind of picked that statistic because I think that's the more normal use case, if I could venture that. I know I think there was a bit of a hype cycle with big data and data lakes, and, and I have so many rants as I live in the business more. As one of the, I know I'm getting old when half my sentences start with, don't get me started, um, but well, there was a sort of a period where data lake was the thing and everything else was sort of 
you didn't need that anymore. And I think a lot of us knew that was never realistic because there's this and condition, right? You can have a data warehouse, which is great, and you can have a data lake, which is great. Um, and I think more the more advanced organizations I work with have both um, and are using both in conjunction with each other to have the best case scenario. And we'll talk more about that. Of One of the other reasons it's so exciting to be in data nowadays is there are so many choices and, and this is where things like data diversity can help uh, kind of demystify what some of those right choices. So BI analytics not going away anytime soon is a huge driver for business insights. Um, as a little more insight into this, this was that survey where folks said, what are your main goals for implementing data management in general? So you'll see that analytics and reporting were huge, that idea of saving costs, reducing risk, uh, driving revenue and digital transformation we've talked about already. Reducing risk I thought was an interesting one because that's going to tie into another thing which is near and dear to my heart, which is data governance, which will be something else we'll talk a lot about because it came up a lot. It's a massive driver. Um, so data governance, it, it's one of those things that I, I was pleased. The other day I was at a client and I heard a 20-something uh, young professional say, oh, it's that buzzword of data governance. And I just think, wow, we've made it. Now data governance is a buzzword. It used to be sort of anathema that, you know, you don't mention the governance. That's something people think of like brushing your teeth that you have to do, but it's not very exciting. I'm seeing the opposite. And I think it's the opposite for several reasons. People are realizing that to make all of this sexy stuff work, like AI and like the digital transformation, you need your data right. Um, data diversity, I think it was just yesterday, came out with a kind of a trends report on data governance. I'll give them a little plug. Um, and I had put some comments in on that uh, article. And, and in that article, I think I gave the anecdote that I've actually had some kind of venture capital startups doing AI come to me and saying, could you, we need, could your company give us some training in data governance? Because we don't want to invest in this company that's doing AI without a data governance foundation. And I said, okay, now for me, <laughs> that is We've made it because I always think of venture capital and AI as sort of the move fast and break things culture. And if even the move fast, break things culture is realizing you have to govern to get the AI right, I think that's a great sign. Um, so people are realizing if I'm going to be data driven, I need governance, I need data security, which was even higher. Um, and in my color commentary, I think folks get security almost before governance. That just seems a little more visceral. You know, you don't steal my, my, my data. Uh, governance is a little more nuanced. It's about ownership and traceability and things like that. The other one I put in there, um, I'm very passionate about. Um, it, when I've talked in the past, you might have heard me talk about governance, and I always kind of summarize it with the carrot and the stick. The stick is, you know, manage your data, make sure the data quality is good, don't do this, don't do that. And this is a part of that doesn't motivate most people, um, but the idea of uh, collaborating better and working together as a team um, and, and work making sure the data is improved so you can do data-driven business and collaboration and AI tends to get people jazzed up about this um, and then the rest comes. So most of our data governance um, implementations sort of start there and it's what is our core, you know, we've all done these, what are your core principles? What are the top 10 principles of data governance? And that can be dry and boring and seem academic, but if you get them right, it's, you know, there was one I've, I've talked about before we were at a hospital and it was, you know, improving the lives of, of children in crisis um, that were in, in intensive care. And when there was an argument about a master data management field, people actually brought that up. Guys, we're here to help children not die in the helicopter as they're getting medevaced. Um, we need this data field. And so I, that was an extreme example because it was so mission driven. Um, but I think what we found when you get that core principle, we're trying to do X with data, we're trying to, you know, maximize profit or we're trying to understand the customer or whatever, people want to make sure the data is right. And then they do data governance because they want to, not because they have to. So that seemed kind of preachy, but we just see it work all the time. It's, you know, get the hearts and minds and the rest of it follows. But if you're just trying to force rules, it generally doesn't happen. And because data is so hot, I'm just seeing that happen a lot more easily. You know, people are asking, you know, do we often start some of our strategy engagements with interviews and we have business people asking for governance. Can we please have some more data governance? I'm sick of arguing around KPIs. Can't we agree and just put it in the glossary? Um, that's great because people have felt the pain, right? So I found this interesting um, when we're talking about collaboration, who drives data management in an organization? Um, one of the things I thought was heartening, um, and you'll see here just to note to be data correct, it said select all that apply. We didn't say just pick one. And I think the positive of this 
is that people are working together. You'll see business stakeholders, analytics, architects, um, CEOs and CIOs uh, driving this, which fits with what I've been seeing, and I think that's great. Because if any one of those groups does it alone, it's not going to work. If, if business goes off and does shadow IT, it's not going to work because IT is a thing. You have to have some skills. If IT goes off and does you know, shadow business and <laughs> doesn't listen to business, that's not going to work either. So you really need all of that. Um, but one of them, and this is probably a gap in our survey, uh, when people sort of did their own what's the other, uh, most people that typed data governance lead. And I think that actually makes a lot of sense. And when we say, you know, when you hire someone for data governance, who is that person? We often say that's the champion, that someone's going to get hearts and minds, they can do data project management, but they can also really lead and be a data leader. So that really fit well, and that was a good call out. Um, moving on from that, um, I, I think this seemed realistic to me too, is that most people now, I mean, if unless you live under a rock and, and you're a business person, you've seen data, you have seen it in Forbes, you've seen it in Harvard Business Review, I mean, data is the new oil, all of those statements we've all heard, right? But I think where people break down is, um, I don't exactly know how to do that, because that's not my you know, wheelhouse, I haven't been trained in data. Um, so I think people are, are at the stage, I know it's an asset, but if you look at some of the other findings, not quite there yet in terms of data quality, uh, maybe formal metrics aren't being managed, communication isn't still quite there, if you can just think of the different personality types from the CEO and the CIO, you know, not the stereotype, but, you know, business folks tend to be move fast break things, right, and your CIO is probably going to be um, kind of more, you know, um, cautious because they have to be, things are going to break and they're going to be held accountable, right. So. Um, I think this is probably also healthy that people are realizing that that one's kind of hard to read. We say, do you trust the data quality of our assets? And it's sort of low, which means data quality isn't good. It's kind of a negative there, double negative. Um, um, and people don't, which could be seen as a bad, but I think it's a good that they're actually paying attention, right? If people weren't looking at the report, they'd be like, ah, sure, whatever, looks good to me. Um, so I think the more self-critical <laughs> is probably a sign that people are paying attention. So I guess it's how you read the data, right? The data storytelling. Um, so this last one was not in the survey, um, but I put this in because I keep hearing it, and I found that really interesting. Um, it's probably been about the past six months where I've gone into clients and they have sort of brought up, or even I've shown them the framework and they've said, where's ethics? You have governance, but what's the ethics? And I thought that was a sort of an aha moment for me. Um, and these are not always the nonprofits in the data for good type companies. Sometimes they're, you know, your traditional bank or retailer or, or, or insurance company, um, or, you know, manufacturing company was one of them the other day that was talking about ethics, um, and I think a lot of us, you know, we all are both consumers and products, really, in a way. <laughs> if we're on Facebook or if we're on Google, we're, we're a data product, right? So I think we can feel it a little bit, that idea of I can do that, but should I do it? Um, that's one side. On the other side, I am, and we do work with a lot of uh, nonprofits that really this idea of, and you can Google it, there's tons out there, data for good, and I think some of it is people who've been in the industry for a long time and have, have done, you know, may have been profitable through data, and they say, no, I'm going to give back. How can we use data to, this is a, um, if you're not familiar with them, the United Nations has sort of global sustainability goals. So many companies are sort of compensated on, you know, can we reduce costs and increase revenue, and that's not a bad thing, um, but these global goals are you know, are we helping health of our community and alleviating poverty and equality and, you know, peace and justice and all those things that we probably should be doing but sort of get lost when we're looking at just at profit. So that's a whole initiative that I, I am just hearing and seeing more of and I thought it was worth mentioning. I think also not only are people mentioning explicitly ethics as part of data governance, um, but I've noticed I'm a big fan of customer journey mapping um, because and, and kind of doing data overlays on that because it really helps you hone in on how to use that data. And I've heard some sort of, um, what do you call it, uh, 
uh, skepticism isn't the word I was looking for, but uh, around customer journey mapping, that it seems like folks are just trying to make more money off the customer, and maybe that's true. Um, but I've seen more of an explicitly empathetic customer journey mapping. What, what's, you know, one set hands, what's frustrating our customers? Can we walk through in, in the customer's shoes? Would this feel creepy? <laughs> we worked with one university and that was actually part of it. What does it feel to be a student and how does data support that? Um, so I'm seeing that actually used for good as well, of more of an empathetic, we're getting data from our customers, how does it feel? Or can does our customer support process you know, do people want to work with a chat bot, with AI, or with they have rather a human being? How can we use data to make customer journey more pleasant? So I, I've just seen that um, coming up, and I'm, I guess, generally a fan of that. So I thought it was worth kind of mentioning because it's just something we've we've seen a lot. Um, okay, so I talked a lot about the people and the process and the governance, which is important. But what is also important is the technology, right? We can we can have great governance, but if there's no data platform, then it's probably not worth having the governance. So what is still true, and I still think it's a good thing because they are good <laughs> solutions, 81% um, are still using relational databases on premises. So if you actually add it in, in the cloud as well, it's even higher, probably close to well, it's hard to say with the, the way we calculate the data, but definitely in the 90%, it's probably close to 100, that most organizations have some sort of either cloud-based or relational database. What sort of keeps me up at night is that you'll also see that 71% are still admitting to using spreadsheets as a data platform. So it's probably higher for the folks that don't want to admit that they're using data spreadsheets as a data platform. Now that said, I'm a big fan of spreadsheets. I use them myself. Um, I just wouldn't use them as a data platform. Uh, for kind of ad hoc analysis or actually doing financials on them, that's good, um, but they really shouldn't be a data platform. Um, and we'll talk more about this, that the data, relational databases are fine, but that's not the only thing for dinner anymore. Um, and there's a lot of other options like cloud, uh, cloud-based, which is still relational, but graph, NoSQL, big data, there's just a lot of different use cases, as Jennifer touched on in the beginning of this whole presentation. Um, so here, here's the data that we got kind of those highlights from that you'll see, you know, far and above both kind of the, the two big pillars there, relational databases and cloud-based relational databases, spreadsheets, <clears throat> and um, a lot of other, but a lot of other is definitely small. What I also thought was interesting is if you look sort of the bottom, uh, legacy platforms are still fairly high. I mean, they're higher than graph databases. They're higher than Internet of Things, is that a lot of companies, a lot of big banks, a lot of financial institutions um, still have COBOL mainframe. Uh, one could be a bit snarky and say, well, they're still working, so don't knock them. <laughs> I wouldn't say do any new development on a mainframe. Um, or maybe you could argue with me in the chat. Um, but what I, I, when you look ahead, what I find interesting is Relational databases, more, a larger percent, are moving to the cloud, um, but they're not going away, and there's still a high percentage. I mean, they are very good for what they do. I mean, they were designed with, you know, relational algebra as a thing, and it helps with data quality, and it helps with traceability. Um, and I find a lot of clients who aren't even at that level of maturity, the number of clients we sort of go into databases that are sort of used like spreadsheets, um, that really don't have any referential integrity or some of the great things that relational databases are good for, uh, there's still a lot of maturity right there that could happen. Um, but what makes me feel very positive is that you'll see those lines kind of spread out, everything else, and that feels about right to me because I don't think this idea that anything, and which was my rant earlier on the call, <laughs> Relational databases aren't the best thing. They're one of the options. Data lakes aren't the best thing. Neither is graph. And I know sometimes vendors can try to say we're the only thing, but they're just wrong. <laughs> Not that I'm biased. All right. There's a tool for every job. It's like saying a fork is better than a spoon. Well, if I'm drinking soup, then I don't want to use a fork. Um, that should be obvious, but I think when we get into tech, we're there's sort of that fear of missing out. Am I, am I in the wrong platform? And it is stressful. Uh, you'll see towards the bottom, there's a high percentage that admit they don't know. And it's not because you're dumb. There's a lot of options out there. So I think this idea for a medley or an ecosystem of tools rather than a tool 
makes a lot of sense. So if you go back to Jennifer's use case that I really like, the do I want to find, oh, I forgot his name, Dave, Bob, I think it was Dave. Do I want to find Dave? Do I want to defy Dave's friends? Do I want to see the transactions around Dave? Do I want to see social media around Dave? Those all have a different use case. You know, graph could be the social connections, relation, a master data hub can be find a single Dave, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, realizing that and mapping out those use cases is a great way to start. What was interesting when we kind of went into future technologies um, was something we didn't really talk a lot. A lot of the folks that kind of we, maybe we shouldn't have put it in the other category, this idea of containers and Kubernetes, they were kind of the same thing, um, similar, <laughs> that, you know, can I, can I, especially with this complexity, kind of box things out in a container to make them more portable? Not a bad idea. Um, the future plans uh, sort of sync with a lot of what I'm seeing as well. This idea of moving, if we can think of BI as just your bread and butter of I need to make data-driven decisions based on, you know, common KPIs, we'll still be doing that for a long time. That's still critical and it's still complex. Um, but to move past into more AI, deep learning um, use cases is interesting to a lot of people. I think a lot of people realize their data has to be good to do that. Um, the next two sort of fit into a particular category, so I found that interesting. Um, Industry 4.0, actually uh, the client I'm here right now in Latin America is looking at is, is doing just that. We were just at the plant yesterday looking at their sensors and how, and it was way cool if my nerd can come out a little bit. Um, so the amount, when you think of that, just that is everything. That's both new, and when that, if you think of the um, slide I have is like the new new business model and the current business model. Yes, you're being more efficient um, and you can automate, but it really is a new way of looking at the industry. Uh, digital twin, I kind of put in a similar category instead of doing, um, and actually this client is doing that as well or looking into it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, change the actual machine or car or boat that I'm building. I can do a twin and kind of do some of the, you know, the virtual version of that as well. Um, kind of test before you do it in the real world, which makes a lot of sense. So I thought that was kind of interesting, which is a little bit different than everything else we had talked about in the survey. Um, as we look at kind of key driver, I know it's a busy slide, but what, what folks are currently implementing, we kind of touched on already, BI did a warehousing, um, and then governance and quality around that. Again, when you look at the next few years, uh, things looking in kind of these new technologies like semantic web, I, I was a little bit surprised actually that that was so high, um, that was the highest one. Um, hearing a lot about it, um, but I think the idea of graph and things like that that are related are really interesting to people. Uh, virtualization, do we have to move the data at all or can we have a data virtualization layer? And then some of those others um, aren't a surprise around data science and analytics and big data. Um, as well as self-service, more and more business people want to get their hands on the data. I mean, most, many business people are being quite savvy with data now. Um, and then to support that, you'll need metadata management and governance to make sure that that data is right. So that, that again, sort of felt right, right and good to me that it seemed to align with what, what I'm hearing at least. So we, we sort of promised on this webinar, what is the next big thing? So I, drum roll please, I don't think there's any one big thing, which you might have already noticed, there's a lot of little things that become big. Um, but if I had to pull Donna Burbank's top five predictions for 2020, um, here they go. You have to put something out there. I think this blurring, of, and I just kind of touched on this blurring of, quote, a business person and an IT person is blurring. I think a lot of business people have been in the past very savvy with data or, or becoming even more so. It's being taught in the universities, you know, R and Python are just ubiquitous. And the tools are becoming so much more user friendly that people are, you could call it shadow IT or you could say, call it, depending on the use case, business are becoming more active in, in understanding data. I also think this idea of blurring data management in business will continue when you think of digital transformation, data is the business. Um, and often sort of corrected by some business people, it just seems so weird. What is a business person? It could be a scientist, it could be a teacher, it could be a actuary. You know, try to tell an actuary they're not a data person you might get a funny look. So I think that'll continue to blur. Um, you know, we're, we're just becoming a more tech savvy, you know, world. Um, number three, we kind of talked about that there won't be this one thing that everyone just buys a relational database and puts it on a server, that there's a, you know, a mix of data centric tools that, and that's why we need to become more savvy, that it's a, a ecosystem um, that work together. Um, 
I mean, not necessarily in order, but I think this idea of governance and ethics will have a much stronger role, which is a good thing. I think, again, is where we are all both uh, products of, of data and, and also users of data. Uh, we start to understand that at a, you know, a deep level. Um, and I think AI and analytics and BI, of course, will continue to be a strong driver, but I think more of a focus on predictive analytics, not just descriptive. Uh, AI is definitely becoming hot. I, you know, there's probably, I think if you think of the Gartner hype cycle, I think a lot of people do have that bit of fear of missing out with AI and should, should I start with AI? I don't think it's a fit for everybody, of course, but I think for those who are, it's definitely an exciting time and something that people can sort of move forward to. So, um, just to kind of summarize again, this white paper, most of the findings here came from that. So you can download it at uh, either Data Diversity or Global Data Strategy. Um, if you are interested in these, uh, there'll be plenty of more throughout the year. You can register uh, now or later. Uh, quick plug for Global Data Strategy, we do this for a living. So if you need help, let us know. <laughs> and I want to give some time for questions. So I'm going to pass it back to Shannon, who can open up the floor. Donna, thank you so much for kicking off the new year with yet another fantastic presentation. We love it as always. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder for this webinar, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording and anything else requested throughout. And um, we'll invite Jen to join us as well at, in the Q&A as we go through. Now, Donna, on page 11, what do the bubble sizes represent? Um, so, to reference for folks, I'll make people dizzy because there's a faster way to do this. Um, so, on page 11, this was supposed to be the relative size. So, the, the majority of customers came in finance and insurance, the smallest came in restaurants, and then the other ones are kind of indicative of overall number of clients that were for our, for our particular business. I couldn't, I didn't get industry. This is just for us of the number. Uh, you can see the relative size. Love it. So the higher percentage use of um, spreadsheet is because of evolution of big data processing as customers are confident now that the spreadsheet can now easily be integrated. Is that true? Um, I, I will get Jennifer's point on that, but I'll answer first. I don't think so. I'm still seeing uh, folks either just using it because it's there and it's quick or um, sometimes going around the, the official KPIs want to do it themselves or it shows a lack of integration. I think there's a use case for spreadsheets. Um, for example, if there is a trusted data source and you want to download it into a spreadsheet and kind of slice it and dice it if that's how you're comfortable with, that's fine. But I think of using it as sort of an official source or a trusted record, um, that makes me nervous. So I'm not sure big data would change that. I think it still needs to be managed and governed. But Jennifer, I'll pass that to you in case you have any additional thoughts there. Yeah, and spreadsheets, I think, you know, it's also dependent upon the size of your data and the processing of the data. If you're just storing, you know, flat um, data tables and it's not past a million lines or something like that, whatever the limit is, then, you know, you could maybe manage. But there's a lot of things like uh, data governance, security, and um, you know, when you have collaboration or more people accessing the data, then spreadsheets become much harder in a group setting. I think that's a great point you touched on last is that collaboration. I mean, there's some online editing together, you know, Google Sheets and things, but I think uh, that's one of the biggest things you miss is a spreadsheet on someone's hard drive that's sort of limited for sharing. Um, so, Donna, you mentioned, you know, you asked each plat data platform and storage has its pros and cons for various use cases. And with that, in your experience, have you seen any papers or studies that document some of those? Uh, the different use cases for the different platforms? Yes. I'm not sorry. Um, well, I think Jennifer had some good ones in her presentation. Um, uh, some of the upcoming, uh, I think a lot of the data first, the stuff does. I know last year I did one on graph and talked about some of the use cases on graph and we'll be doing some. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, I can't point if just one, I guess. I guess a lot of, you know, sometimes it's actually going to the different vendors who is a graph and kind of listening to their use cases versus relational and uh, summing that up. 
I don't think there's just one stop shop, unfortunately. Agreed. So understood. And Jen, I have a question for you. You know, a lot of your use cases were um, for profit examples. Do you have any um, government examples? Government use cases? Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which ones I can actually talk to. But I can talk to like you know we have state and local. So federal examples, um, I think the IRS is one that's public. There's also one for parks and recreation, but that was, you know, again, very massive amounts of data is where Cassandra shines. So for the smaller, um, you know, data use cases, it doesn't mean that you can't use Cassandra, especially if you need something mission critical or with high availability. Um, but, you know, it's with the advanced security, um, that we built into the platform that resonates well with the government. And then um, the scaling across different organizations or different services um, or different units within local government is, again, a lot of the reasons why people come to Cassandra, because we can scale across not only geographies, but across data centers and, um, you know, sort of join across disparate data sources. Um, and in some cases, you know, across, again, different platforms, so on-prem versus cloud um, or different clouds. So um, I know that doesn't answer the question directly, but, um, you know, if you want, if somebody wanted to reach out to me separately, I'd probably go through some other cases. I'm just not 100% sure which ones are confidential. Oh, no, that's a great answer, and, and that's, I think that's very helpful. And I will, of course, include um, the information for uh, DataStack's contact uh, in the follow-up email. So, um, continuing through here, you know, what's a digital twin? Um, a digital twin is, um, it, it really is sort of a, a digital representation of the thing in the real world. So, one example, one of our uh, customers we work with was a big oil rig. And so, you want to, you have kind of a, I think of a CAD, a, you know, an auto, a CAD diagram where you, or you kind of design a house or you design a car or you design, in a way, that's sort of a phase one digital twin. Um, but the digital twin, you can actually kind of do, um, analytics on, you know, kind of use case analytics. So what if we, you know, took out this pipe, what would happen? So you can, or I guess, yeah, I guess they're doing some of that in medicine. <laughs> you kind of test it out on the digital twin before you have to go out to the oil rig and actually change that pipe. Um, so it's kind of nice. You have a, literally a kind of digital representation of that physical object that's out there in the real world that are often really complex. I uh, love it. And what is industry 4.0? Um, so Industry 4.0 incorporates, incorporates a lot of different things, but if you think of kind of that next generic, I guess you could say, industry, uh, I probably should know this, Industry 1.0, you know, forward with automating the the, um, the cars, you know, on the production line, um, but things are much more advanced now. So think of sensor data coming from the machine. So, you know, the client that I'm at today, everything's done with robotic arms, um, and they're actually building this big machine. Uh, robotically, and then you sort of have um, sensor data. So you can say, when does this thing need maintenance? Um, I see that this uh, screw, e either, you know, through uh, analytics, a screw of this type or a pipe of this type uh, uh, made of this material generally wears down at this time. But you can actually also look at the data itself and say, hey, this thing is starting to wear out. Or, um, you know, the, this, this particular company has sort of production line statistics, and this production line is based on the weather and based on all of the big data sources, you can say of, hey, we need to, it might slow down a little bit uh, at this season, or maybe you have to do some proactive things. And this, this company, they need to add some better viscosity of the oil based on the temperature, you know, so really using data to drive industry. And, and so it's not just automation, but it's that kind of next level real-time sensor data, and then linking that, and I guess it's like the Uber of, uh, power plants or whatever you're you're automating that you can you know think of Uber who can look at the the airplane traffic and the car traffic and consumer demand and kind of put all those together to get a car there for you in five minutes. It's kind of the same thing for a plant. How can we look at all the different factors and automate it and scale it and, and kind of use data for this advantage? And speaking of automation, and Jen, uh, you might want to weigh in here as well. You know, what will be the role of AI in 2020 and, and forward? Um, will we have any data-driven AI or knowledge-based AI? 
Yeah, I can kind of touch on that. I'll jump in here. Um, I think for AI, it, it, the amount of data will just grow exponentially, right? You're collecting so much data so that you can not only learn the patterns, but like forecast and, and project patterns and things like that. So the analysis on the data will become really important as well. Um, and, you know, that will demand high levels of performance on masses, massive amounts of data. So we call that like AI scale uh, when we talk about how, you know, something like a, an Apache Cassandra can address those uh, coming use cases. But we, we see that really impacting uh, the data world and data management for sure. Don, anything you want to add to that? Uh, sure. Yeah, no, I think, and I might be the big beat that's going to come uh, soon, but uh, hey, there we go. <laughs> um, that I think it's going to be sort of what I mentioned, things like dot-com became sort of business as usual and you almost don't notice it anymore. I think you know, we all think of Siri and Alexa and we think of AI or I do or chatbots and things like that are sort of you know externalized. I think what's more exciting actually is the stuff behind the scenes of AI for the plants, like I mentioned, that can I do predictive maintenance? Can I, or AI in my phone that kind of knows the best route for traffic or based on my past usage or I think it's some of that stuff that just really automates the next predictive level, next best, next best action type things um, that maybe aren't the kind of in-your-face robots, <laughs> but kind of the stuff that's really driving the business, I, I think is probably more interesting. Well, Donna and Jen, thank you so much for today's presentation, to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. But I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording. And I'll I get you a link to the uh, re report that Donna was talking about as well. And hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Data Stacks for sponsoring and help making these happen. Thank Thanks, you. Donna. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.